This is District 24. This is District 24. This is District 24. Frederica Wilson has normalized all that you have seen for the past 22 years. A recent study named District 24 as one of the top 30 poorly represented districts in the entire United States. My name is Christine Alexandria Olivo, and I am running for Congress because we deserve better than this. I grew up in El Portal with a big family and big dreams. My grandfather used to stuff envelopes to make extra money. My grandma would cook enough food to feed the kids in the entire neighborhood so that no one ever went without. We struggled, but we always got by. My grandma used to say, Christine, one day you will get us out of this. As a child, I did not understand what she meant. I thought it was normal to work three jobs to live. I thought it was normal for medical bill collectors to call the house. I thought it was normal to have three families living under one roof. I thought it was normal to get pulled over with my brothers in the car. I thought it was normal to bury your friends at a young age. My grandmother died in October of 2018. When I went to the cemetery to make her arrangements, I passed a picture of a young boy with a big smile. I was shocked, but the funeral director said, we get kids all the time. As a mother of two beautiful boys and a former youth educator and youth advocate, I want you to know that it should not be normal to bury your friends at a young age. It should not be normal to be racially profiled. It should not be normal to be unable to afford a home for your family. It should not be normal to not afford health care. It should not be normal to work 18 hours a day and never enjoy your life while our Congresswoman is absent from work and still gets paid with our taxpayer dollars. My opponent hides her mediocrity behind the 5,000 role models program, and yet 77% of District 24 does not have a college degree. I am running for Congress because it's time for a new normal. It's time for this district to have a representative that will show up. It's time for a representative that will listen it's time for a representative that will fight. I will fight for common sense gun reform. I will fight for a $15 minimum wage. I will fight for Medicare for all. And on November 3rd, when you elect me, Christine Alexandria Olivo, as your next Congresswoman, I will fight to make you proud every single day. My name is Christine Olivo and I approve this message. Hello everyone, I am here with a phenomenal candidate running in Florida's 24th Congressional District. Her name is Christine Olivo, and she's here to talk about her campaign. Christine, welcome to the program. Hi Mike, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, all of the viewers who uh, are tuning in just saw your ad. That's one of the best ads I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of political ads, and I like that you talk about the district. You show a little bit of the problems. We see some images of people sleeping on the streets, people, uh, you know, needing things that aren't uh, being delivered to them right now. And you propose real solutions. And I think that this is something that we see with up and comers who are, you know, uh, going to Congress. They actually have a clear policy agenda. And I know that, like, that shouldn't be revolutionary if you're running for Congress, but honestly, it doesn't feel like it's the norm. And I think that candidates like you are bringing it back. So tell us about your campaign and who you are and why you decided to run for Congress. Thank you. Um, and thank you for showing the video. Actually, um, a very interesting thing about the day that we were shooting the, the video, we were on our way to an abandoned apartment building 
when we saw the hostage situation happening. That clearly was not planned. We were driving by and we said, forget the abandoned apartment building. We need to cover this. We need to cover the cops and the streets shut down because this is what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. This is normal activity in District 24. And that's why I'm running. That is the very reason why I'm running. In the video, I talk about uh, the moment that I decided to run was when my grandmother had passed and I go to cemetery and there I see Trayvon Martin's grave. And I'm thinking my grandmother lived to be just a few weeks shy of her 93rd birthday. And she's buried in a grave with children. And that's when I said, enough is enough. I looked at my own two kids and I said, if not now, then when? So I decided to jump in. I tell everyone, I'm not a politician. I'm a mom with a purpose. I'm fighting for my children. I'm fighting for your children. I'm fighting for a future for all of us. I've lived in this district, born and raised. I, I, have, I have seen what we can be and I've seen what we have become. Unfortunately, this is not um, this is not the future that was promised to us. And the incumbent has been in office for such a long time, even in Florida state legislation for such a long time. There is no excuse for 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 there to be that many homeless people on the streets in this district. There is no excuse for people to not have health care. A quarter of the district before COVID did not have health care. Now that we have hundreds and thousands of unemployed um, constituents, imagine the, the, the percentage it is now because their health care was tied to their employment. So now we are facing, we are, <laughs> you think we're living in poverty now? If we don't get a hold of this right now with someone that's bold, that's ready, that's going to actually show up to do the job, then I, I can't even imagine what the future holds. Yeah, it's honestly scary. I mean, the future really looks bleak and it's it's never seemed as if things, you know, were going well. But I think that this pandemic has really put everything into perspective and it exposed the plethora of flaws in our system. And I think that you, you put it so perfectly in your video where we've normalized so much and we've kind of just like subconsciously accepted things that are terrible. I mean, it's not normal to not have healthcare. It's not normal to work 18 hour days, you know, and still mm -hmm. struggle to pay rent. These are these are things that we've accepted as normal. And finally, we're starting to wake up and, you know, really push back and say this isn't acceptable. Now, you, you yeah. kind of touched on this, but your, your opponent, her name is, uh, I believe, Frederica Wilson. Yes. She has been in Congress um, for quite some time, not as long as some other individuals. Can you talk a little bit, bit about her? Because, I mean, there's a lot of lawmakers who kind of fly under the radar. And to me, she's one of them. Like nationally, she's not well known. But why do you think she's not, you know, um, meeting this moment? So Frederica Wilson is, um, everyone knows her as the hat lady. She wears her extravagant cowboy hats. But no one knows her by any legislation that she's passed. They don't know her by, I mean, she advocates um, for, you know, the women. There were young girls in Africa that were, that were kidnapped and she advocates for them. She does have a program here locally called the 5,000 Role Models Program that, that helps boys, um, black and brown boys, get through high school, go to college. Um, it's a great program. Unfortunately, only 19% of our district has a college degree. So there's so many missed opportunities there. And the issue is because she doesn't show up. You can Google it. She has the worst attendance. She does not show up. She didn't show up to vote for the HEROES Act. She's not showing up now. She's voting by proxy. Like she's not showing up for the people. She's not using her voice. She's not using her platform. She's collecting a paycheck and she's honestly being funded by big corporations. So who do we expect her to be indebted to the people or to Carnival Cruise Lines? Yeah, I mean, it's really that simple. All you have to do is follow the money and you will see where a politician's loyalty lies, which is it's really refreshing to see 
you know, now dozens of politicians step up and actually get elected, not taking any money from large multinational corporations and just like purely funding their campaigns through the people. I think this is revolutionary. And what's interesting to me is that the response that you see from the corporate Democrats who don't like this is they try to say, oh, well, you know, you don't represent this district because you're taking money from people all around, you know, the country. They're, they're out of state donations. But I mean, if you take money from a corporation, is that corporation's headquarters in your state? Aren't those technically worse out-of-state donations? So it's just, it's hilarious to me that they find some way to do these mental gymnastics. And speaking of corporate Democrats, so if you go to Congress, you would be another member of basically the squad. You'd be part of this growing block of people in Congress who are openly progressive and unapologetically left-leaning, which we absolutely need. So my question to you, it, you know, it, it's tough because you're not in Congress yet. So the dynamic is it, difficult to imagine what it would be like. But let's let's assume Joe Biden is elected and Democrats have a really short period of time, two years where they actually take back the Senate. Uh, they have the House and the White House. So there's going to be a rift. There's going to be fighting between a lot of you know, corporate Democrats and individuals such as yourself who are pushing Medicare for all. How do you, and I don't think there's any perfect answer to this question because I don't know myself. How do you, as someone who's advocating for Medicare for all, try to push the envelope more towards that direction instead of a more incrementalist approach? Because currently in the House, it seems as if people uh, in the Democratic Party at least support Medicare for all. I don't know how much of that is just like to appease their base or if they have a primary challenger. But in the Senate, it's a lot more difficult. So what do you do to push the Democratic Party in that direction? Because you're going to butt heads with them. Um, do you have a strategy going in? Because I personally have no idea how I would proceed other than to just be loud and obnoxious. I mean, I was thinking about being loud and obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, that question has been like the in the, the forefront of my mind. How can I make this difference? How can I do it? I think the first step is getting more allies, right? So if, if we can expand the amount of people, it's got to be one person at a time. And when you're talking about Medicare for all, you have to break down all the excuses that people can give. Okay? So, so everything, even running this race, everything that I do now, it's all about strategy. What is going to be our strategy? If we can explain in numbers how it would make sense and expose those numbers to the American people, anyone that can go against the, the proof that's in the pudding, if they can go against it, then they're going against the people. So if we can actually sit down and say, okay, let's calculate what exactly is it going to cost? What is it going to save? And we're talking taxes, everything. We need to lay it all out there no more hypotheticals put everything down and see what it can be right take the corporations out if we can show the people not even i'm not even talking about the senators and and the representatives show the people expose the numbers to the people then they would have no choice but to hop on board you have to show proof everything that i do now everything that i say it's like christine you've got to show proof Talking about Medicare for all and saying, oh, it's not going to raise your taxes. Show me. Let's show them. If we believe that that's what, that's what our country needs, if we believe that it's possible, let's show them. And I think that's a really important point that you raised in terms of like talking about polling numbers um, and what the American people want. Because there's this underlying assumption, if you watch any mainstream media segment on Medicare for all or healthcare, there's this assumption that, oh, well, the people don't want this. They, they wouldn't want to lose their private insurance. But that's not true. Like public opinion polls show that a majority of Americans want Medicare for all and a plurality of Republicans even want it. And in some polls, these are outliers, but a majority of Republicans want it. So the problem is that we've been lied to and we've been uh, you know, uh, taught to be afraid of uh, what other countries take for granted and wouldn't want to live without. So I think that if you actually bring the American people into the, into the conversation, um, not only could that help to shame uh, politicians and really get them to show their cards and where their loyalties lie, that is with the American people or corporations, but it also could galvanize the public because I think that, you know, if, if politicians and a larger block, including yourself, say, look, polls show Americans want Medicare for all, prove it, show up to Congress, 
protest. Help us get this passed. I think that can really make a difference because the problem yes. is that people in Congress aren't necessarily organizers. And this is one of the benefits of getting people like you elected is, you know, you all have a background of activism and advocacy. And this would make a world of difference because the people that we've seen in DC, it's like these politicians who follow this like perfect career path. They go to Ivy League schools, they get elected. And it's like, we don't need people who are playing a role. I want people who are on the ground. And that's a really important role that I think you would serve. I, I do want to ask you another question because this is something that is becoming a little bit more of an issue. Um, it, it's ranked choice voting. And there's a specific bill in Congress. It's H.R. 4000. And what this bill would do it, is it would permanently end gerrymandering. It would make uh, ranked choice voting nationwide. And on top of that, it would make America have multi-member districts. So rather than us just electing one uh, representative per district, there'd be maybe two or three. So that way the vote is more proportional, uh, meaning that like we don't have this majoritarian system where, okay, this one person got 60% of the vote, but the 40% aren't represented. Uh, so it's yeah. a lot better, I think. And it could open the door to a multi-party system where we don't just see Democrats and Republicans. Would you be open to sponsoring this legislation or co-sponsoring this legislation? It sounds great. I I think that we need to, I mean, I love the, the, the founding fathers, but I think it's time for us to abolish the electoral college. There's yeah. a lot that we need to do to change the way that we vote, to change the way that we're represented. And that sounds fantastic. I would definitely be interested in learning more about it. This is actually the first time that I'm, I'm hearing about the bill. Yeah, a lot of people don't know about it. When I, I, I showed up to a town hall in, I think, 2018 with Suzanne Bonam Bonamici, my representative, and she never heard of it as well, uh, because it, it's one of those things that kind of flies under the radar because yeah. it, it's tough, right? Like, how do you sell this to members of Congress when you're basically asking them, will you make your party not have as much power by supporting this bill. So, you know, I, I think that people who are more principled, uh, like progressives such as yourself, you know, it's an easier sell, which is why yeah. we have to get more people like you elected to Congress. Um, well, okay, so- I'm running as a non-party. So, you know, okay. it's, re it's really, um, for me, I think that it's time for us to start balancing our districts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's having a multi-party system wouldn't be the end all be all in my opinion because you still have you know the influences of capitalism but i think that it would it would make us a lot better off i think um yeah. you know uh, so i want to ask you about um covid19 and in the event you're elected realistically speaking what do you think congress can do to actually mitigate the spread of the virus because we're seeing i don't know if you want to call it like an extension of the first wave or the second wave but we're seeing cases spike again what do you think we can do uh legislatively to actually stop the virus from spreading because i think that this really is the number one issue to a lot of americans right now because it's affecting people when it comes to their health it's affecting them economically what can you do as a lawmaker so the first thing that we need to do is realize that this has been mishandled from the beginning so we're, we're we're going into chaos it's sad to say that another shutdown would have to occur because a lot of places have shut down but they haven't reopened properly so then you see the extension of the first wave or the the second wave whatever we want to call it i think we need to do a real shutdown um i think that we need to make sure that we're, we're doing our due diligence to get everybody the health care that they need. A lot of people are getting sick because they didn't have preventative care for other issues. So really taking charge with health care would make a huge difference. And also we need to be able, so the anxiety that people get from the shutdown is how are they going to pay their bills? How is everything going to get done? You know, who's going to teach their child? If we had a stimulus package, and I'm not talking just $1,200 once, I'm talking about $2,000 a month until we can get through this crisis. Understanding that this was not a quick fix. And the way this was handled was as if it was a quick fix. Taking the time, giving the people the money they need, the security that they need, the health care that they need, and then taking charge and really listening to the scientists, listening to the doctors, 
and doing what we have to do to stop the spread. We can't stop, we can't stop COVID. It's already out there, but we can stop the spread. Getting a mask mandate. I mean, I can make you a list of things that we can do. Unfortunately, because we have a, a president that thinks this is a joke, our country, our, our, we have lost thousands, hundreds and thousands of loved ones because it has been mishandled. So the first thing that I want to do is take it seriously. And from there, we can go down the line and take care of the people, give them what they need to stay home, stay safe, and let's get through this. Yeah, I think it really is that um, that simple. Just believing in science, number one, is a giant step. Um, and you, you can really look. Um, I have a segment on the program where, you know, uh, this uh, graphic designer basically took all the data from the New York Times and he tracked the rise of COVID cases uh, by state. And all of the red states have spiked where the blue states are starting to get it under control. Now, they're all going to kind of go up at the same time. It's not like they're going to completely eliminate it. Uh, but you, you can see simple things that blue states have implemented that really make a difference. Mask mandates, for example, as yes. you brought up. I mean, in my state of Oregon, we didn't have a mask mandate. And whenever I would go, out, I'd see like maybe 30, 40 percent of people wearing masks. As soon as the mask mandate is uh, implemented, 99% of people are wearing masks. Like something like that really can make a difference. And a mask mandate isn't the end all be all. Of course, I mean, the, these are really complicated things, but it, it, it helps. And the fact that Republicans won't even do the bare minimum in just listening to scientists and their own CDC, which they control because they're in, in charge of the White House, it's astonishing to me. Um, yeah. So overall, um, I, I think that anyone who's watching the show and they hear about your policies, they know you support Medicare for All, UBI, living wage, worker rights. They're already going to be sold just by definition because like you you check all of the boxes basically. But the election is coming up super fast. What can we do to get you across that finish line? Because it's it's difficult. You you are at a disadvantage because you don't take corporate money. Having said that, though, a lot of candidates who don't take corporate money have won. Jamal Bowman, uh, AOC, Cory Bush. So it, it's not impossible anymore. So what do you need from us to make uh, make this a reality? Well, like you said, I take I, I'm funded by the people. Donations, donations, donations. Uh, volunteers would be great. I need people at the precincts. A lot of people, the way I, I tell everyone in Miami, if I invite you to my little kids party in about like giving you like a month or two in advance notice, you won't show up. But if I invite you about two days before the party, you will be there. Last minute people. We do things on the fly. I need people at the precincts to help me get those last minute voters in. People that haven't heard about me, haven't heard about the, the mission, the message, fighting for the people. I need people there. If you want to donate, go to www christineforcongress.org. If you want to volunteer, go to www.christineforcongress.org. If you just want to learn about me, go to www.christineforcongress.org. At the end of the day, the underdog can win. What I need is a vote, right? I need the votes. So most importantly, if you live in the district, please consider voting for me. I would love to fight for you in D.C. Yeah, I think that's perfectly said. Um, it, it's it's so nice to see so many candidates run for Congress. Uh, I, I say this all the time, but like in 2016, I could count the number of progressive congressional candidates on a single hand. In 2018, you know, there were more. Uh, I couldn't yeah. count them on one hand, but we weren't winning as much. Now, I can't even keep track. There's so many. Yeah, and everywhere. That's one like thing to be optimistic about, honestly, because like after, you know, progressives lost the primary after everything just seems to be going horribly. I mean, we see a lot of people stepping up across the country running for Congress. And that in of itself is, I think, cause for celebration. Um, so, yeah, thank you, because individuals like you who are stepping up and doing this tremendous like deed of self-sacrifice to run for Congress. I mean, I would never want to do it. So the fact that you are stepping up and dedicating your time uh, during a pandemic of all times. 
um, it's it just, it's really remarkable. And I hope that my viewers will consider sending you, uh, even if you have a buck to spare, I, I think that really can make a difference because if a hundred people send a dollar each, that's a hundred bucks. That's a lot of money. That's more mailers that can go out. If you still have time to send out mailers, you know, who knows with how yeah. much, how much time, but, uh, thank you so much for coming on the program. We will be rooting for you, Christine. Thank you so much. And I just want to let everyone know it's not easy to do this. I'm a regular person fighting for everyday people, but I want you to know that you can do it too. You can do it. So if you have that desire in your heart, if you feel like you can run, you can represent your community, I dare you to put your name on that ballot. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. I hope I can come on again after I win. <laughs> Absolutely. As a member of Congress, how awesome would that be to bring you on the show? Yes. <laughs> Take Thank care, Christine. You.